Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Great pleasure, and and I say this with all the humility I can muster, which most of you know is not much, uh, but... Uh, I could count on two hands the amount of people in Alcoholics Anonymous that took their alcoholism to a further depth than I did. And I am honored to introduce one of them tonight and uh, just has an absolutely incredible story. And an old friend, you use your last name, Matt. I'm Matt. I'm grateful alcoholic. I'm grateful to be on another meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know what Alcoholics Anonymous has given me is I'm grateful to be sober and above ground. And uh, you know, I wasn't that way for most of my life. And if I could have been dead, I would have been grateful. And and to, who in their right mind would would want to be sober? I it's just. Drinking saved my life for a long time before it became my worst enemy. You know, that the person with one day, man, that's... You know how awesome it is to stand up and say you got one day? It's really uncool, but it's it's a start of recovery, man. I, uh, I wouldn't stand up when I had one day. I had to be cool, and, and but it takes longer. If you're really cool when you come in here, it takes longer to recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. But uh, so that that's awesome, and, and I mean, you know, I think it's really neat because people just won't do things in Alcoholics Anonymous today like they did when I got sober. Uh, but we didn't have a choice. They told us we were going to do it or get our asses kicked. So. Uh, we just did it, but, but, uh, James and Matt came up here with me to Reno and, and, uh, Matt has, has a six months, but he doesn't have a driver's license. So he had to let James drive and he's a newcomer. <laughs> yeah. And that's willing to go to any lengths to come to Reno, Nevada with a newcomer driving, you know, from Fresno. <laughs> and, uh, And, you know, because they think a lot, you know. And, and so. <laughs> Matt just acted like he was asleep the whole trip. No, but it was a good time. And, and you know, I love Alcoholics Anonymous more than anything in the world. And I'd like to thank Tim, Tim for asking me to come up here to Reno. And, and uh, you know, I've known Tim a long time. I knew him back in, in Las Vegas. And, and uh Dow for letting us stay at his house because the hot August nights there's no rooms available and and I think it worked out better getting to stay at his house. He's got a nice house and he lets have a run of the place and and he asks us it not to destroy it. He's trying to sell it. <laughs> uh, but he has a he has a, a spa overlooks up on the hill overlooks all of Reno, so we went out and got in the spa last night and and overlooked Reno and and uh, told a bunch of lies and you know, it was a, <laughs> it was a good time you know yeah you know, I was thinking uh one day new and uh, you know I don't know if they give you a book or not and, and if you start reading that you're going to get really depressed because a big book it starts out you know. It starts out telling you you're maladjusted to life. The next sentence says you're in full flight from reality. <laughs> and God, things are looking up now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I read a little bit further and tell you you're, you live in delusion. <laughs> you can't differentiate the true from the false. That was like my first year of sobriety. They keep telling you to keep coming back. It gets better. My first year in sobriety, I got uh, indicted for income tax evasion. 
I was at a noon meeting. And my wife changed locks on the door while I was at the noon meeting. <laughs> I had emergency back surgery my first year. I got indicted for murder at nine months sober. I thought, man, if this shit gets any better, I don't know if I can take it, man. <laughs> It does get better. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I'm on my eighth divorce. Uh, I was thinking about this stuff sitting there when it was one day, a uh, one day new car. I was thinking, man, I'll tell this stuff and make them real excited to jump into the steps of sobriety, man. <laughs> no, but it is, it, it's a good deal, you know. And, and this isn't my first time around Alcoholics Anonymous. My sobriety day is January 26, 1987. And, uh, yeah, I've been coming around Alcoholics Anonymous since 1975. And the reason why I don't have all those years is because I did it Matt's way. You know, I get the courts off my ass. Uh, you know, I, uh, I do just what I had to do to get by. And then when I couldn't take it anymore, I take the drinking again. And I'm not one of those perfect alcoholics. I take anything else that, that I can mix with it to try to find that right combination to be okay. In our book, it says we drink essentially for the effect. And when I first took a, a drink of alcohol, it produced that effect that I chased for a lot of years. And it was just to be okay. Nothing glorious. Just for the madness going on inside me that I couldn't deal with. I didn't know how to deal with was I just wanted to take a drink of alcohol to make everything okay. No matter what's going on in my life, I chase that effect. And, and I would add anything. I would shoot tequila gold up in my veins to try to achieve that effect. Um, if you have never shot no alcohol up, it's pretty cool. You get drunk like real instant. <laughs> um, inside of your body feels like it's on fire, but, you know... It's, uh, <laughs> If you're short on funds and, and you need to get there right now, it's it's real good. It works real good. And uh, I probably should have tried something shooting it up first besides tequila gold. That tequila gold, man, that that stuff was really nasty to shoot up. And uh, but uh, <laughs> I got the good parts yet. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've been to, we've been to a lot of meetings since we've been in Rio, Nevada, and, and I hear people talk about starting to drink, you know, and they're 17, 18 years old, and I've been in meetings and heard people not start drinking daily till they were 30 years old, and it's like, God, why waste so many precious good years? You know? I started drinking, uh, in between the third and fourth grade. It's because my parents got a divorce, and that's no big deal. Our book says we're selfish and we're self-centered. It's the root of all our problems. And I never realized that till I did the inventories and now clocks numbness. It was a rude awakening to find out that I had brothers. And they had, we had the same parents. You see, this was just happening to me, not nobody else. Not nobody else in the world. And I don't know how to deal with being a feeling, whether it's Right or wrong, feeling abandoned, feeling like I was unloved and unwanted. And, and you know, I don't know how your mind works, but, but my mind clicks into when, when I can't handle something, that, that false illusion that we live under. See, my mind clicks into what do people do to enjoy life? My mind clicks into my parents have party, they drink and they have fun. Seems like they have fun. And in reality, like when I guzzled my mom's Bacardi rum that first time, I like to tell you I became better looking and it tasted good. And man, that stuff tastes like shit, man. And and when and you'll hear people talk about when it went down and hit their stomach and how it just spread so warmly throughout their body. Not me. When that Bacardi rum hit my stomach, it came right back up. And on its way up, I remembered, oh, yeah, people puked and it stinks. And if I don't keep it in, my mom's going to know I stole her Bacardi room. 
And so I held, I got my hands and my nose and my mouth real quick, and that crap went up and down about 20 times. And... <laughs> and it finally stayed down. And once it stayed down, what had the alcohol, what the effect that it produced was that sense of ease and comfort. That it didn't matter what was going on. And, and I didn't start drinking in the mornings immediately. It took a couple weeks. And, uh, you know when those kids would pick on you at school because you're a sissy little boy and you live in a little town and, and nobody else's parents are divorced and they pick on you and you bawl your eyes out and they, they steal your lunch money and, and man, you know what? Uh, just face another day of going to school, you can't do it, man. And, and, and the guy you hate that lives across the alley becomes your best buddy because his mom always has hot Thunderbird sitting around and, and you get that bottle of hot Thunderbird and, and you guzzle it down before you go to school and, and you hold your hand over your nose and your mouth and, and, uh, let that Thunderbird go up and down another 20 times and, it hits down the stomach and all of a sudden you know what? Those kids aren't going to pick on you one more day. And the first kid that goes to pick on you, you whip his ass. Cause you're no, you're no longer full of fear. And the second kid picks on you, you whip his ass. And, and by the time you get to class, the word's out in school, don't pick on that Matt Green kid, he's crazier than hell. <laughs> and you become the tough guy of the school. And you know what? Uh, your parents are divorced and, and they're in the bars and and you want to feel like you belong like the rest of the kids and their parents buy them a brand new bicycle and and you know I don't know what kind of alcoholic you are but I always overshoot the boundary no matter what it is you know and uh, so so you got to go steal the bicycle huh? but you got to steal four of them so you're better than they are <laughs> you got to be the top dog no matter what. And so you get in trouble if you do things like I do. And if you grew up in a little town like I did, you know, everybody came to town on Saturday. It's a big event. And, and right at the edge of town, they have this fire hydrant. And they did things like try to humiliate you into not doing that kind of stuff anymore. And they handcuffed me to that fire hydrant with a can of silver paint. Saturday morning, they expected me to paint that fire hydrant. What they didn't realize is there's two kinds of guys born in this world. Fire hydrant painting kind of guys and non-fire hydrant painting kind of guys. <laughs> and I was born the non-fire hydrant paint kind of a guy. <laughs> so all the humiliation in the world isn't going to make me paint that fire hydrant. So if you act like I do, they take you to juvenile hall. And you're full of fear there too, so what do you do? You, you thump on the first guy you see and, and the word scatters through juvenile hall, don't mess with this crazy white boy that just came in. And you become the top dog in juvenile hall. <laughs> <coughs> you know, my mom's boyfriends would beat the hell out of us. And, and through the beatings and waking up in a pool of my own blood the day before I turned 13, I couldn't take it anymore. And, I moved in with the president of the Hells Angels of the Fresno chapter and they gave me my colors that night and I thought this is, this is where I want to be, you know, cause I ran around with these guys some and, and wherever we went, people didn't screw with us, they ran from us and, and you see that's, that's where I want to be because if you get close you might find out I'm full of fear. And so it was a safe place to be with these guys and, and I was never going to take that stuff we're not supposed to talk about here and, and now call it anonymous. But I must have got drunk enough, you know, and I want to fit in. I remember they say, take these. I didn't ask them what they were. But I, but I want to fit in with these guys and, and I take them and, and all I remember is the next morning I can't make it to work. And they go, you know, and, when I was 13, when I was that age, I pulled these transmissions out, they rebuilt them, and I put them back in. And they said, take this white stuff, you'll make it to work. And I don't want to take that white stuff, but I want to fit in, I want to do the deal, I don't want to be no little sissy. And So I take that white stuff, and and my boss, he drinks and he gets loaded, you know, and so he knows what, what's happening. And 
And he comes over and kicks the creeper and goes, man, you're, you must have took too much of that white stuff. All you're doing is spinning round and round on the creeper. You're not getting the work done. <laughs> I told you, I, I always overshoot the boundary, man. And he goes, you better drink something and slow down. And and, and so, I, you know, I followed direction. Well, I, I drank something and the next thing I know, he's kicking the creeper and said, you must have drank too much. All you're doing is sleeping. <laughs> and I went home that day and drank and drank and drank and uh, I couldn't go to sleep and they, they said eat some of these you'll go to sleep and so I ate some of those and started this madness of these combinations of things to oh Matt wanted me to do that so you guys know how a blind guy tells time uh, you know I started the never ending madness of chasing this uh, taking whatever it took to function in the world and to be okay. You know, I, I was visiting, doing the things I do, I visited the institutions a lot and, and ended up in the California Youth Authority. And My dream was to turn 18 so I could go to jail like tough guys do. And I turned 18 and, and my dream came true. The only thing I'm saying, you know, I don't know how you guys do it, I know when you get to A, you don't like to take the inventory steps. But when I get locked up, I'm always sitting there doing the inventory. What went wrong, what I should have done different. And I'm sitting in this jail cell for an armed robbery, attempted murder for shooting a cop. And, and I'm thinking, you know what? A guy in my status needs to go to jail. You know, you guys like me, that's just part of the deal. You, you, the, the more clout you have if you go to jail and stuff. But, but I like to, you know, I want to be dead by I'm 21. The world sucks. But, and I'm only 18, so I got a few years to go. So I would like to start out like assault and battery or a simple robbery and, and work up to shooting cops later, you know. <laughs> I, uh, I don't want to start there, you know, and, and, uh, I'm thinking, man, what do guys do to not go to jail for shooting cops as soon as they turn 18? And it's like, man, they're getting married and having kids. And, and that's a scary place for a guy like me to get married. Because uh, you have to let someone know that there's feelings there. And, and if you let someone in that close, they'll find out you're scared. And you can't never let anybody, no matter what it costs, let them know that you're afraid. But I thought, you know, if I ever get off these charges, and uh, you know, because there's no God in the world. I didn't believe in God. Uh, I tried it one time. I gave God three minutes. I asked for something, and if there was a God, I gave him three minutes to produce it, and he didn't produce it, so therefore I proved no God. Uh, and I didn't want her anyway, so it uh, wasn't, no big, <coughs> wasn't no big deal. But I beat those charges. And I get out of jail and I thought, okay, that's what I'll do. I'll get married. So I check with all the girls I'm engaged to and, and, uh, this one said she's pregnant and back then, you know, you did the right thing. You married her and, and a bunch of us hell's angels and stuff came to Reno and we got married. And, uh, and, and that marriage was destined to doom, man. Because that girl, she either lied to me, we need to go in the world against book of records because that kid didn't pop out for 18 months. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I don't think I have to tell you I was a little bit ticked off about that deal, you know. And, and, and so there's an indictment for me in California. And so I move up to Reno, Nevada. This is heaven, man. You know, they got 24 hours drinking and and, you know, they got that free booze here, right? You give them your paycheck and they give you free booze, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the town's just happening, man. And I live in this little hick town where they ride horses and got cow shit on their boots and, you know, just, you know, a guy like me needs excitement in their life, you know. And so Reno was a real good place. And besides, they got an indictment for me in California. So I'm here, man, the second day I'm here, I'm sitting in jail going, man, how did they found out I got here so fast? 
See, no matter where I took me, I didn't go anywhere to change. I did the same things. And and before long, I got another indictment for me in uh, Nevada. It's like, man, I need to slow this crap down. I've already shot another cop, and I got off those charges. And You know, I know that the government, the United States government, will, will make me behave. They'll straighten me out. Vietnam War is gone. Everybody's dodging the draft. I'll do my patriotic duty. Like I really give a shit, but I'll go join the army. And I, I, you know, I ride my Harley all the way back to Fresno. And that's a real scary thing. What if you get pulled over and you go to jail? Your plans are disrupted. And I'm going to join the army and become a ten-star general. And, and, uh, you know, they don't have ten-star generals. And, and if you're thinking that that's true, I'm going to become the first one. And it's going to take about six months, and then I'm going to sell dope and steal army tanks and sell them and shit. I, about nine months in this deal, I'm going to be a millionaire. And I'm going to live happily ever after for the next two, two years before I die. And and I get down there. And, you know, this is a big commitment for a guy like me, so I buy all this booze and all this stuff. And... And I'm taking it all the way back to Fresno, and, and I get to the recruiter's office, and I look, man, there must have been about a thousand steps up going in them double doors of the recruiter's office. I'm thinking, man, you know what? As wasted as I am, I'll never make up them steps. You know, that's how alcoholics always have a good plan, eh? I get to thinking, if I rev this motorcycle up real good, I could probably make a all the way up them steps, I'll hit that landing up there and I'll shut it off and I'll walk in the double doors. Well, I guess I overdid a little bit too much. Up them steps I went. By the time I got to the top, I was airborne so the brakes didn't work too good. (laughs) And I crashed right through the double doors. The motorcycle and all. I shut that baby off and told him I'm the one you're looking for. <laughs> they were, <laughs> you know, they got my civilian record and they didn't want to let me in. And, and uh, you know, but uh, there's some relatives I had that were in the service I got to go in. And, and this is a big commitment for a guy like me, right, to join the service. Serve my country. I'm going to Vietnam, where you can legally kill people and don't go to jail. So, uh, so I get to go in the service. I buy all this stuff because everybody from the West Coast is going back east, right? But it gets time to get on the bus. So I, I get enough stuff to get there back east. And, uh, Got time to get on the bus, and everybody from from the West Coast got on the buses. They said, Matthew Green, I go, yeah. They go, you're getting on this bus over here. I go, where's that bus going? They said, Fort Ord, California. From Fresno, that's about a three-hour bus ride. And I may be making this major commitment, but I am not going to throw this crap away I just bought. So i got to take it all. And, you know, if you take that much stuff and you're on the back seat of the bus, when you get to Fort Ord three hours later, you're a little slow getting off the seat. And if you don't know about the service, they have these screaming drill sergeants. I don't, nobody screams at me. I'm sitting on this back seat of this bus, really drunk. I come up with a good plan eight. I get the, and if you've ever rode the bus, you know you gotta go down the center aisle. That's a long ways down there. And when you get to the end, you gotta hang a hard right, and you go down steps, right, to get out. I get to think, if I can muster up a little speed down that center aisle, hang a quick right, put some momentum into it, one punch at drill sergeant, he'll go out like a light. And I did that. And he did, he went out like a light. As he was going over, I seen there was these two seven foot gorillas standing behind him. Instantly I knew that was a wrong decision. <laughs> First ten minutes I'm in the army. I'm locked up in the stockade. Doing another inventory. <laughs> saying this was a wrong decision to join the United States Army. And you know, I get in a bunch of trouble while I'm there and 
I've had enough fun, and uh, and I split. And, and I was talking to Dal because he he lived in Salinas and he didn't know this story happened in Salinas. You know, I mean, I'm able from the service. I'm needing some wheels fast to get away, and and I found an abandoned armored truck, and and I know it was abandoned because there was nobody in it, and it was running, <laughs> and. And I mean, I don't believe in God, but, but you know what? I just got rewarded real well. I got some wheels and some money to boot, you know. And it took him six months to catch me. And, and you know, you know how funny it is when it's not your money, how fast it goes? I didn't have none of that money left. And they took offense to that and they sent me to the federal penitentiary. And I, I kind of got in trouble when I got there, and they sent me to the hole, the first thing. And, and that's where I spent the whole time in the federal penitentiary, was in that hole. I never came out of it. And you talk about fear. You know, you're all by yourself, but you want to cry because you're afraid. But you don't dare cry because someone might hear you. And thank God the, the Vietnam War was going on, so the Army got me back. And once they got me back, they decided they didn't want me anymore either. And I got out of there and, and, uh, I got to thinking, you know what? You know, I'm, uh, not even 21 years old and the world really sucks and, and I'm going to do whatever I can to die and, and I, I'm just dreaming about my death. You know, not no candy ass death. I'm a tough guy. I want to, I want to be going down the freeway on my Harley and, just drunk as hell and and cops from every county's chasing me and 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 every time new counties come in they're pumping me full of more lead man and, and they got news cameras in they're flying them in from all over the country and every tv station around is is watching the cops pick on me and i i got about 100 200 bullet holes in me and, and my body can't take it anymore me and me and my harley davidson go end over end and burst in flames and god it's glorious man it's on every newscast all over the world. Man, that guy was a tough guy, man. I mean, I, I want this to happen so bad. I'm getting shot by cops, but I'm not dying. And I don't know what I got to do to die. And, and I turned 23, and and the courts decided to send me to AA. It was either go to AA or go back to the penitentiary, and so I had to go to 5 a means a, a, a week, and I went to my first meeting, and they told me what an alcoholic was, and I said, that's me. I'm an alcoholic. But you see, I mean, I was powerless over alcohol, and my life was unmanageable. I mean, hell, I was on my fifth wife already. Uh, your life's got to be somewhat unmanageable to have five wives at 23. Um... <coughs> <laughs> I made a man's to all of them too, with all the ones still living. Yeah. But you know, I didn't have no willingness to do anything different. None whatsoever. I mean, I drove a brand new Corvette to my first meeting, and of course I don't go to the town I'm living in, I gotta go way across downtown to Skid Row to the next town over. Uh, cause I don't want nobody, I mean, what would my, the guy in my stature looked like going, walking into an AA meeting, right? I might be alcoholic, but I can't have that. So, I mean, you go to Skid Row AA, of course it's going to look... I mean, everybody was really, really old in there. They were like 40 years old, you know what I'm saying? And back then, you know, it didn't look like not a one of them cars would make it out of that parking lot. And they tell me shit like, uh, you gotta go to meeting every day and keep coming back. And I'm thinking, man, you know what, you wet brain old fools. You know, you're, you're so old, you know, 40 years old. There's nothing left of life. Why go anywhere? Your car ain't gonna leave the parking lot anyways. I'd stay here too. I mean, you probably only got, you know, if you're 40 years old, if you get lived to 40 years old, I mean, you might only have a couple, two or three days left to live anyways. <laughs> Hell, I could do this same bullshit one day at a time if I'm only 40 years old and only had three or four days left to live. No car to make you out of the parking lot. 
Well, I'd make it real simple too. I got my year commitment, and the court's off my ass. Got my year chip, didn't drink for a whole year. Well, it was 10 months, but it was close enough to a year. I took that year chip. And then uh, <coughs> went on my merry way, and, and I kept getting in trouble, and kept going to A, and, and jumping forward a little bit when I married to my seventh wife, and been going to A for 10 years now. And, and I kicked her out, and she wouldn't come back. We had a little baby boy, and I thought, well, that bitch, how dare her do that to me? Take off. You know, yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of guys have had this thought. You know, I'd give her the best years of my life. I've heard every guy in the bar that's getting a divorce say that. Give her the best years of your life. And then she runs off. The truth of the matter was I, I ran her off. And the truth of the matter was she was a great wife. You know, but I thought, you know what, I'm drunk and loaded. And I think, you know what, I'm not going to let her get away with it. And, and drunk and loaded, I stopped at 7-Eleven and bought two bottles of champagne celebrating. I was going to go over and blow her head off. And I had this shotgun. And <laughs> I get over there and she's not home. And, but it doesn't matter. I kicked the window and her neighbor's out there. And you know how crazy I've been and how much I've been locked up. And... And it don't matter. I kick the window in and I go in there and I'm guzzling these balls of champagne, celebrating, blowing her head off when she gets there and the SWAT team shows up. And you know that I can't go out there and shoot another cop. I just can't do it anymore. But I'm a tough guy, you know. I got, I got my honor to guard, you know. And I can't just walk out there and say, hey, I give up. Let's go to jail. And I thought, you know what, your kids would be better off without you in this world. And I held a, I swung the shotgun up to my head and I pulled the trigger. And, and all I remember after that is, uh, months and months later, coming to out of this coma, strapped with leather restraints, every part of my body that would move, uh, they had strapped with leather restraints. I was all the way blind. I'm still most of the way blind. This is a blur out here. Um, the women look better nowadays, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, and I have a plate in my mouth that pops in there, and if I pop it out, I still can't talk. And I didn't have a plate, and they had life support systems hooked up to me, and tubes sticking out of me everywhere. And, and I, there was so much of my face missing, you could physically stick your fist inside my head, and the doctors would come in on a daily basis and tell me, boy, there's nothing we can do for you. You're going to die. And that's where I got introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous again. Thank God for the people that do hospital and institution work. And, and you do that kind of work whether the person gets sober or not. You don't do it whether they get sober or not. You just carry the message. And if they get it, fine. If they don't, fine. But, I mean, here I am. They come in and ask if they could read me the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like I got a choice in this matter. You know, I can't wiggle my head, no. I can't say no. I want to tell them so desperately I'm dying. I'm an alcoholic, but I'm dying. And they sit down and read that book to me. Day after day after day, month after month after month. And I finally uh, live and get out of there. And Man. Anyways, uh, for the next two years, I go to a million meetings every day. I'm looking at all the excuses. I expected you to do everything for me because I'm blind. And they did the deal. And if you expect A to do it for you, they will. But the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous can't work. You know, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous didn't work till I started reaching my hand out. But I want to die so desperately, man. And I took 455 synthetic morphine tablets with two half gallons of vodka. I saved from all my surrogates, and I knew that would work. You know, what I didn't know of is there's a loving, caring, forgiving God in this universe, and if He's not done with you, all you're going to do is keep missing body parts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, my whole, my whole body's been pinned, wired, screwed, bolted, nutted together, Bone grafts, muscle grafts, skin grafts. I mean, there's no part of my body that isn't scar tissue and, 
and ribs missing. There's only one part of my body left in original shape, and I kind of want to keep it that way, you know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and that thought came to me when I came out of that coma that time was, man, you know what, you keep missing body parts, and man, you only got one part that's left any good, and maybe I'll work these steps, you know. And, you know, I didn't know how to pray, and I got on my knees at night, and I, I looked up, and I said, well, it was a cussing prayer. And that's the best I could do at the time. And I surrendered to Alcoholics Anonymous and to God, and I became willing to do whatever they told me to do. Uh, it's not going to work. But I became willing to do anything they told me, because, you know what, I did it my way. I could not do it my way one second more. I don't understand people coming to their first meeting and staying sober. I don't understand that. It's a lot easier. If I would have stayed sober after my first meeting, I'd have those have a lot more body parts. <coughs> but I, for me, until the madness inside this, you know, that emotional pain was so great, and, and you know, I was so desperate, I couldn't die. Then I became willing to do whatever it took. You know, and I, I started asking for the rides. I started asking. I didn't wait to be asked to go to the coffee shop. I started asking. If I heard you saying you were going to the coffee shop after the meeting, I went over and asked, hey, could I go? But they said no, and I called my sponsor and told him they told me no. He goes, well, it's not their job to let you go with them to the coffee shop. You ask some other people until you find someone who says yes. I didn't like the answers my sponsor gave me. He would come over. He wasn't working at the time. He'd come over and... And, and you know, when when you're new, remember how that is? You have way too busy of a life thinking to fool around with your sponsor for hours. And he would come over and do stupid things like, uh, let's go out and listen to the sounds of God. Who the hell wants to go out and listen to the sounds of God? I'm way too busy thinking. i got to figure shit out, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I did what my sponsor said, and, and I got involved in service, and I got involved in H and I when I was two weeks sober and had my own panel at twenty eight days sober and I got involved in general service and I remember telling my sponsor that, you know, I can't do that. That's a two year commitment. He goes, What's the matter? Are you afraid of committing to stay sober for two years? So at the at the end of two years I felt I could bear serve my group and and I ran again and got for another two years and then I did alternate DCM for a year and and I volunteered at Central Office for a lot of years, and I didn't want to do it, but it became fun. And I was our intergroup chair for six years, and you know I've just stayed actively involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I've I've never gone without having commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know I go to meetings every day. I show up at my home group about 45 minutes early to pick up cigarette butts and make coffee. You know, that's what they taught me to do in the beginning of my sobriety and work then. So, you know, I'm kind of afraid if I quit picking up cigarette butts, if that's the one thing that's keeping me sober, if I quit doing it, will I get drunk? Uh, it worked 16 and a half years ago, so I still do it. You know, if you think, if you're new and you think nothing good could never happen to you in sobriety, man, uh, at two years sober, I got my driver's license. Uh, so if I can get my driver's license back being blind, hell, you got a good shot at it. Man. <laughs> <coughs> you know, I started making those amends when I got to those steps. You know, I mean, some amends you got to make right from the gate. Like when the police knocked on my door because I had warrants for my arrest, I informed them I wasn't on the ninth step, and they didn't give a shit what step I was on. <laughs> IRS didn't give a shit what step I was on either. And, and you know, I thought I was being picked on. I had this little baby boy and, and uh, you know, having to go to A means and take care of this little baby boy and I'm blind and, and just life sucked. For a long time it sucked and they told me, boy, you gotta pray every day and they told me, as a matter of fact, you know, you gotta get on your knees and tough guys don't get on their knees. And they told me, well, when you go to bed at night, kick your slippers under the bed. When you got to get up in the morning, 
Get on your knees, get those slippers while you're down there, pray. Tough guys don't even own slippers. <laughs> I'm willing to go to any length, so I go buy these slippers. <clears throat> I kick them under the bed. The next morning I went to kneel down and screw them slippers. They can stand in there and rot as far as I'm concerned. So it's finding out what will work for you. And what works for me still this day is to throw my wallet with my money under there. I'll guarantee you I'll get on my knees for that wallet. I thought I was getting screwed having to go to general service assemblies and stuff when everybody else is out having fun. I thought I was getting screwed going to, to the general committee meetings for the Northern California Hospital and Institution Committee when everybody else is out going to AA dances and having fun. I thought I was getting screwed when when I got commitments and and I know this guy likes this girl, and I like this girl too in AA, and, and they're both going to the same AA party afterwards, man, at someone's house. And, and I got a commitment, and I can't go. I'm getting screwed in this deal. These old-timers are mean and rotten to me. They don't want me to have any fun. And all those people back then, they're not around anymore. So today I'm truly grateful for the old-timers getting me involved in service. And they told me, no matter what, you keep your commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous. I go, when's the exception to that rule? And they go, if you're dead or having major surgery. I go, that doesn't leave much room for anything else, does it? And that's what I've done over the years. And I've been able to stay sober and enjoy my life. You know, because of, of keeping my commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous, things like when my parents died, I was able, like it or not, to be there and take care of them while they were dying. Like it or not. And they told me, you keep your commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous, like it or not. And because of that, I was the only one of the kids that got to be there. And I called a spiritual experience with my dad. And you know, when I made the amends to him, I called him Shiny. And when he was dying, he hand opened his eyes in a couple of days. And I go, when I knew he was dying, I go, Dad, when you get up there, tell him I call you Shiny. And he opened his eyes and he nods his head, yes, and he closed his eyes and he died. If he hadn't taught me to do it, whether I like it or not, I would have missed that, man. My brothers and sisters know about that story, and they wish they had that experience. But they don't have you guys to teach you to do it, like it or not. You know, I took my uh, ex-wife back to court and got full custody of my child. A scumbag like me got full custody of his child. At a nine years sober. That ain't supposed to happen for a guy like me. You know, my little boy had a major surgery and they performed the wrong surgery on him. And he almost died. And thank God for the guys I sponsored that lived, took turns staying with me in the hospital so I didn't have to kill a doctor. And you know, I told him I was going to kill a doctor and they said, let's pray. And I told him, screw A, screw praying and screw you guys, man. And and they threw me down on the floor. And I told them, I'm your sponsor. Let me up, man. <laughs> and they said, we're going to pray. And the power of prayer, man, I thought, you know, I'll pray and these guys will get off me. I'll go kill this doctor. Everything will be okay. And through praying with those guys, man, when they let me up, I didn't have to go kill a doctor. You know, so the guys you sponsor aren't all, you're not the one always saving their ass. You know, a lot of great events have come to pass in my life. I got married in sobriety again, and I thought, and that was, I'm so grateful to God to get a, to know a marriage like I never knew existed. But we parted, we started going in different directions in our lives, and and that's too bad that marriage had to end. But you know, I got to experience what a relationship, what a marriage, what what true. Unity's about in, in a relationship. And, and uh, you know, we're going to, that divorce has been going on for a long time. And it's okay. You know, they taught me, no matter what goes on in my life, I go to meeting every day. No matter what goes on in my life, I work with newcomers every day. No matter what goes on in my life, I make the five phone calls every day. No matter what goes on in my life, I listen to tapes every day. No matter what, I do the deal in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I leave the results to God. And my life's always gotten better because I've done that 
No matter what, now Alcoholics is anonymous. You know, it's, um, it's time to quit. And I'll tell you what happened to me here recently that that just truly, truly amazes me what can happen if you do the deal now, Alcoholics Anonymous. <coughs> I got my contractor's license back, and I'm the only blind licensed contractor in the state of California. And they didn't want to give it to me. And all my felony convictions after I got my license, and now I lost it. Well, I was in the hospital, and but I got it back. And a little while ago, I I get this call. And it's a cop on the other end, and and here's something. If you're new here, I'm gonna give you some good advice. If a cop calls you, because I didn't know this, until I worked the steps. If a cop calls you, don't hang up the phone. They already know where you live. <laughs> That's a that, that's pretty spiritual knowing that you know. Uh, but you know he wants me to come over and build jo- a job for him at his house, and I get over there. Here's this cop car. It's bright. Here it's broad daylight. This guy's dressed in a SWAT uniform. His cop car's in the driveway, and it's broad daylight. Man, this is a setup, man. <laughs> But I go out there anyways, and I hold out my hand. I go, hi, Matt Green. He goes, I know who you are. I go, oh, shit. He goes, I used to arrest you. He goes, I was the first one on the scene when you shot yourself. I've heard nothing but good stuff about you for the last 15 years. And I bid this guy's job, and I get home, and he calls me back and wants me to come back over. It's just a one-day job. He wants to add a little bit more. So I go back over there and he, he adds a little bit more and he goes, well, when can, I give him the price. He goes, when can you do it? And I go, well, we'll do it tomorrow. We don't have nothing to do tomorrow. We're getting ready to start another job. And he goes, well, I won't be here. He goes, well, he reaches in his pocket. He pulls out these keys and he peels out this house key and goes to hand me his house key and goes, here. I ain't taking, yeah, I, I may be sober. <laughs> I may be blind, but I ain't stupid. A guy like me, a guy like me don't take a cop's house key, you know. He goes, no, go ahead and take it. It's okay. And and so I took that cop's house key. And I like to tell you, I've done all this crap in alcoholics and all this. I'm so spiritual. I went home and slept like a baby that night. That's not true. I went home in total fear. <laughs> I didn't sleep at all that night with that cop's key in my pocket. I did not like having that cop's key in my pocket. <laughs> we went the next day and we did the job and and he pulls up right as we're cleaning up and uh you know, he hands me a check and he's in a SWAT uniform and and he's also in charge of the rifle range and we're talking and and he opens the trunk up and he's pulling out all these different kinds of automatic weapons and stuff. He goes, and they're loaded and it's broad daylight and his neighbors are mowing the lawns and shit and he's handing me these guns, man. And I, I don't like this situation, man. And, and I lie to him. I tell him, man, I gotta go to the bank cashers check sign and pay my guys. I just wanted out of there, man. I mean, I'm, I'm full of fear, man. And he reaches over and he grabs me and puts his arms around me. And I put my arms around him. And he starts crying and I start crying. And it's broad daylight. And God and everybody can see this hell's angel and this cop crying and hugging. And, and he tells me, Matt, it's a privilege to know you and I love you. And I go, you know what, man, I love you too. And only because of people like you and this loving, caring, forgiving God here, that great events have come to pass for me and it can happen for you too. Thanks, and God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.